Hey guys, what's up? It's Charlie here, and today we're going to be looking at what the last 24 hours of a death row prisoner looks like. Before we take a trip to the electric chair, why not subscribe and press the notification bell too? Okay, let's start at the beginning of the day, 4.30 a.m. That's right, these inmates are woken up incredibly early on their final day. That's because there's a lot to do. So unfortunately, on your final day, there's no time for a lie-in. You're woken up at 4.30 a.m. and are immediately given breakfast. Prison wake-up times are usually from 5 to 7 a.m. But for the inmates facing their last day on Earth, as if it couldn't get any worse, they have to wake up super early. They will then get a standard prison breakfast. This will often be eggs, some wheat, some toast, some coffee, and some milk. Not exactly gourmet, but it's worse than nothing. This will go on until around 6 a.m. Then they have two hours of waiting around time. Now let's fast track to the next stage in their day, 8 a.m. At 8 a.m. they'll have a very, very emotional experience. That's because they'll get their final visits from family and friends. At this time, their family and friends will come and say a final goodbye to them before they depart this earth. That is, if their family and friends want to see them. Some of these people have done such bad things, nobody visits. But if you do get any visits, then they will likely be very emotional. Many officers have reported crying and screaming at these visits because they're so sad. Just imagine knowing it's the last time you're ever going to speak to your family member or friend ever again. This will go on for around 2 hours until 10am. Then at 10.30am, they have their next stage of the day. At 10.30am, they'll receive lunch. Now, this may sound like an early lunch, but remember, they had breakfast at 4.30am. This prison lunch may consist of rice, beans, and juice. Another popular prison lunch is a stew, cornbread, and mashed potatoes along with vegetables. This will take them up to 11.30 a.m. And at that point, they're not taken back to their normal cell. Instead, they're taken to a special holding cell for people about to have their lives ended. They will then have to sit in that cell for nearly four hours. And then the next big stage of their day comes. This stage is very important and it happens at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m., they have a visit from their spiritual advisor. This is a clergyman from whatever their religion happens to be. For example, they may get a visit from a priest if they're Christian. If they're Buddhist, they'll get a visit from a monk. If they're Jewish, they'll get a visit from a rabbi. And if they're Muslim, then they'll get a visit from an imam. Of course, this stage is actually optional, and if you don't have a religion, then you don't get to see anyone. However, in many people's final moments on Earth, they may actually turn to religion. For example, it's not uncommon for people in an emergency event to start praying. Well, the same is true for those about to have their lives ended by the state. They may figure in case there is heaven up there, then they should pray to try and get in. Also, if you're on death row, you've likely done some pretty bad things. So, they may want to seek forgiveness and disclose those bad things to a clergyman before they go. Either way, this will go on for around half an hour and then they're taken back to their new cell. But then half an hour later comes their next big step of the day. This will happen at 4pm. At 4pm, the inmates will go into showers and get clean clothing. Now, this may not sound very significant, but trust me, it is. That's because those are the last clothes and the last shower they will ever take. Along with their clean prison clothing, they also have to put on an adult diaper. That's because sometimes after you pass away, you do your business. Yep, that wasn't just a joke in a South Park episode. That's actually true. And don't think they can take a long, luxurious warm shower. The showers are lukewarm and you only get 5 minutes to shower and change your clothing. That's because the next big event of the day happens at 5 past 4. At 5 past 4 their final meal is served. You may think 5 past 4 is early for dinner. But remember they had breakfast at 4.30 and lunch at 10.30 so they'll be hungry. The final meal is a very big part of being on death row. It's the final thing you'll ever eat and you're brought whatever you choose. One inmate named Victor Harry Fuger asked for a simple olive with the pip removed. Timothy McVeigh, who took 170 lives, asked for two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Another inmate flat out refused a meal and didn't eat anything. Now, you're not actually allowed to say no to this meal as prisoners have to be fed three times a day by law. So instead, he was simply served a regular prison meal, but he didn't eat anything. But you can actually ask for tons of food if you wish. That's what one inmate named Michael Woods did. He had taken the life of his wife. However, in the years he spent in prison before he was taken out, he actually was a campaigner for prisoner rights. He wanted prisoners to be fed more, so as a last meal, he did a kind of protest meal. For his last meal, he asked for two pounds of bacon, four large meat pizzas, four fried chicken breasts, 
Two Mountain Dews, two Pepsis, two Root Beers and two Sweet Teas. Two Pints of Ice Cream, five Chicken Fried Steaks, two Hamburgers with Bacon, fries and a dozen Garlic Breadsticks. And by law, he was actually given all of that food. You're given one hour to eat that food. And then you return to your cell for 50 minutes. Then the last event of the day begins at five minutes to six. Prisoners are taken into what's known as the execution chamber. They will then either be taken out by electric chair or by injection. Then there's an allowed 30 minutes to prepare the prisoner in their place. They need to be taken into the room, sat down in their chair and then strapped in. Their arm will then be swabbed and a needle put into it. Then they will begin to pass away, but this could take around 30 minutes. The warden will then read out the court order to the prisoner. The warden will then ask the prisoner if he has any last words. One famous last words were, I did not get my spaghettios. I got spaghetti. I want the world to know this. These were the words said by Thomas Grasso, who'd requested spaghettios for his last meal, but got spaghetti instead. And another famous last words were Just Do It by Gary Gilmore. This actually went on to be Nike's famous slogan, Just Do It. Anyway, shortly after that, the prisoner will cease breathing and they will no longer be alive. Then a doctor will come into the room, check for a heartbeat and do some other inspections. He will then say the prisoner is no longer alive and record the time at which this happened. Also, if there are any viewers to this, as there sometimes are, a curtain will be drawn in the window. This means they won't catch the last moments of the prisoner's life, as they do want to give the prisoner some privacy. The prisoner will then be disconnected from the equipment and taken out to a hearse, which will be parked and waiting outside the prison. They will then be taken to a nearby funeral home and then embalmed or cremated. The body will then be turned over to the prisoner's family if they want it. But at times, they don't, and in that case, the ashes will be scattered. So, those are the final 24 hours of a prisoner on death row. I think if we've learned anything from this video, it's to be good and to never try and get ourselves on death row. But what do prisoners do in jail all day? When an inmate first enters prison, they usually process for a very long time. They'll usually be dropped off at the jail by a taxi, a friend or relative. Or they can be picked up by the local sheriff's prison bus. However, this bus is generally very uncomfortable and they have to make many stops to pick up many prisoners. And they also drop off convicts too, which takes even more time. Going on the prison bus is referred to as a diesel tour and this is generally avoided. But let's fast track to when cons go into their new prison home. First off, their civilian clothing is taken and they're given prisoner clothing. If they're in the USA, this is usually a bright orange jumpsuit. They're also disinfected to make sure they're clean and not bringing things like head lice into the prison. And they also have a very thorough search to make sure they're not taking anything prohibited into the prison. Any of their possessions are catalogued and put in a small box. But convicts are actually allowed to bring in a few possessions from the outside world. Oftentimes, this includes things like books, glasses and legal documents. Convicts and also prison guards refer to new inmates as fish. And when they're being processed for the first time, they're held in a special area of the prison known as the fish tank. New prisoners are held in the fish tank for 30 days while prison officials process their paperwork. They also have to find a room for the prisoner to stay in and maybe give them a prison job. These jobs include things like laundry jobs, maintenance jobs, janitorial jobs, cooking jobs and landscaping jobs. And prisoners can earn around 10 cent per hour for doing these jobs. An inmate stay is not very interesting, in fact, they're stuck in a cell which is around 8 by 6 feet. Their bed is likely made out of metal and is bolted to the wall. And in their cell they will also have a sink and a toilet. If they get lucky, they may even have a window facing the outside of the prison. And due to prison overcrowding, most prison cells now hold two prisoners. Usually an additional metal bunk bed will be installed above the first bed. And the case usually is that the strongest or scariest prisoner gets the top bunk. Life in prison starts at 7.45 a.m. This is when all of the doors are unlocked and you have to go shower. After that, you get some time to eat some breakfast in the canteen, but work starts at 8.30, so get moving. Many prisoners work up to six hours a day, only making around $10 per week. However, the best paying prison job is what's known as prison industry. This could be anything from making clothing to making CDs. The work is often very mundane and generally does not meet usual health and safety guidelines. Now, you may think, why would I want to work for such little money? But prisoners often do. 
The thing is, even though they're menial tasks, it does help to pass the time. If you don't do anything and sit in your cell all day, you may get cabin fever and go insane. You may think that forced labour is a thing of the past, but it's still very much alive in prisons today. At around midday, prisoners are sent back to the canteen to collect lunch. All prisoners are then locked up for about two hours so the staff can have their own lunch. And then at around 2pm, they're unlocked again and they have to get back to work until 5pm. After that shift, they're served dinner, but many prisons actually call this tea. In most prisons, dinner is eaten in your cell, but sometimes it's eaten in a canteen. During dinner, the preferred bunk is actually reversed, and the scariest, toughest inmates get the bottom bunk. That's because you could sit there with your tray to the side of you and eat. But if you have the top bunk, it's easier to sit on the toilet with your dinner on your knee. Prison food is very poor quality and there's not much choice. Usually two to three main course options were available and there's always a vegetarian option. Not only that, there's also a kosher and halal version of every meal. In many prisons, menu sheets are issued a week in advance, so you can choose your own meal. But if you do not return your form to your wing, then you're given the default meal, which is always the vegetarian option. There are even some low-fat meals which are specially prepared, but these are only for inmates with doctor's notes. Meals are typically things like stews, and things which can be made in a large pot. Also, the meals have lots of carbohydrates, as they're very filling, but not nutritious. Pasta, potatoes or rice are usually the base of most meals. In many prisons, breakfast is actually collected for the next day at the same time you have dinner. This is usually a small, single portion of cereal and some milk. You may also be given some tea bags or some coffee mix. For lunch, inmates are usually given a sandwich, often cheese, and sometimes also a packet of potato chips. And during Ramadan, a special menu is made for those who are participating in that. And usually in prison, lights go out at 10pm. Many prisoners who are facing years behind bars are only allowed outside for one or two hours per week. But if you're inside for something pretty minimal, then you may be allowed to go out for longer than that. But typically, prisoners have to get used to life indoors. At 10pm, lights are supposed to go out and prisoners are supposed to be quiet and go to sleep. But apparently prisoners do break this rule often and make lots of noise and stay up late. But now we know what happens to new inmates and the daily routine of a prisoner behind bars, what is ghosting? Well, ghosting is basically when an inmate is being released from jail or moved to another jail. Normally, when this is going to happen, an inmate is advised a few days in advance. This allows the prisoner to say goodbye to their friends they may have met in prison. When someone is ghosted, they're usually told the night before. This happens after lockup, and it allows them to pack their bags, but also not mix with other inmates. This makes it impossible for them to settle any scores or collect any debts. Also, it stops other jealous inmates from injuring them. Also, while they're being ghosted, they won't have access to telephones to inform anyone on the outside. And for some high-risk inmates, they won't be told where they're going until the next morning, so no one else in the wing can know. Prison involves a lot of logistics, and all of these are scheduled and arranged for weeks in advance. Sometimes, for an inmate to progress through the prison system or to manage population levels, they're moved to another prison. But before that, a fit-for-travel medical assessment must be made by a doctor. Ghosting is also done for emergency situations. For example, prison guards may learn that an inmate is in imminent danger, or maybe they are themselves causing problems and have to be moved. And in very extreme cases, if someone's being destructive, they're taken to segregation, which is known as the block. And then, they're never seen again, as they're taken to another prison. Also, prisoners who are being ghosted are woken up at 7.30am. That's one hour before every other prisoner who's woken up at 8.30am. This allows them to get out of the prison and where they need to go without any trouble being caused by any other prisoner. So now you guys know what it's like for a new inmate behind bars, the daily routine of a prisoner and what ghosting is. Inmates reveal prison life hacks they use. Coming up first, we have bed bugs. There's one big big issue in every prison that many people don't realize. But anyone who's been behind bars will know that bed bugs are a big deal. Bugs are a big problem in prisons, especially older ones. Prisons are not exactly the most clean places on earth. They don't have huge budgets and there's not cleaning people coming around making sure everything's neat and tidy. So that's why inmates have come up with a way to make sure their beds are bug free. What inmates do is take jar lids and put them under the legs of their bed. 
they then fill these lids with water. This will ensure that bugs cannot climb up their bedposts. That's because bugs of course cannot climb through water, so they'll simply get stuck in this trap. Of course, they will still climb on the walls and ceiling, but this life hack does prevent inmates sleeping with spiders in their beds at night. Next up is Dental Floss. One of the most valuable things to an inmate is some dental floss. But that's not because inmates really care about their dental hygiene. You see, dental floss is incredibly versatile and can be used for almost anything behind bars. Many inmates use dental floss to stitch up clothing and sometimes they use it to create clothes lines for drying their clothing. Some inmates also use dental floss to cut soft foods like cheeses. But the main use for dental floss behind bars is a method of communication. Inmates will tie written notes to one end of dental floss and then throw them to other cells. If the note doesn't get to the right place, they simply reel it back in like a fishing line. It also ensures that if a note doesn't reach the intended cell, then a security officer won't see it. Otherwise, inmates could risk giving away key info to a prison officer. Also, if you gather up a lot of dental floss, you can bind it together and make a strong rope. Sometimes this is used to escape, or sometimes to harm others. Next up is hair dye. Just because you're locked up doesn't mean you don't want to look good. And that's especially the case for many female prisoners. Many men and women do like to dye their hair behind bars. But most prisoners won't have access to beauty items like hair dye, and chances are they're not going to let you out of your cell to go to the local salon. So that's why many inmates will make hair dye out of hot water and a powdered drink mix like Kool-Aid. A powdered drink like Kool-Aid has lots and lots of food dye inside it, so it can be used to dye hair. Sometimes inmates will also mix conditioner into this to make an easy to use paste. So Takashi69 can keep his rainbow hair behind bars with this trick. Next up we have toothpaste. First dental floss and now toothpaste. You may think that inmates really care about their oral hygiene, but that's not why they're buying Colgate. Instead, toothpaste can be used for many things including patching up walls. A lot of the time in prison, prisoners want to hide various things they're not allowed to have. They do this by making a small hole in the wall to hide their contraband. And then to fill in that hole, they use toothpaste. Sometimes they can even begin to make small escape tunnels and fill that in with toothpaste. Toothpaste is also used behind bars for getting stains out of clothing and shoes. In prison, laundry services are very limited. And finally, toothpaste is used for soothing bug bites. As I mentioned before, there's lots and lots of bugs in prison. And even if you do use the jar lid technique, you may still get a couple of bug bites. Next up is tattoos. One big part about prison culture is inmates giving each other tattoos. A lot of the time, this happens if a prisoner joins a prison gang, and in some prisons, this is mandatory. Of course, it's not enforced by the prison officers, but the inmates themselves. And sometimes, for fun, inmates do like to give each other tattoos. Now, tattoo shops need lots of licenses and have to have checks for sanitation. But behind bars, all of that goes out of the window. Instead, they make a tattoo machine using a motor from a CD or cassette player. They also use a battery pack and a pen. For the ink, they often mix shoe polish and water together. One very popular prison tattoo is to get a teardrop underneath your eye. You actually only get this if you've taken a man's life, so if you see someone with that tattoo, then run. However, because of how unclean this tattoo method is, many inmates sometimes get infections on their tattoos. Next up is prison wine. In most prisons, you're not allowed booze behind bars. And that especially goes for fine wines. But did you know that behind bars, inmates make a wine known as Pruno. Pruno is made from fermented fruit, and it's known as a prison wine which they make to pass the time. Some say the wine tastes a bit like the drink Four Loco. But basically what they're saying is it does not taste good. Inmates will sometimes mix this together in a toilet, but many inmates, if they have it, will use a container. The ingredients they usually use are peeled oranges, brown apples, sugar, yeast, warm water, a fruit cocktail, and some raisins. Sometimes it can be hard to find yeast, so instead they'll use breadcrumbs. They mash all of this up and then store it in a bag in a dark place for 7 to 8 days. Now, personally, if I was locked up, I would not be drinking this. 
But prison can get pretty mundane, so wine can spice things up every now and then. One inmate described the taste as a nasty sweet and sour margarita, but he said the plus is it does give you a buzz. And finally on the list, we have hair curling. This is another beauty tip many female inmates use behind bars. Many women in prison may want to have beautiful curly hair, but you will not be getting a hair curler behind bars. That's because it could be used to hurt other inmates. So instead, they'll use the roundness of an empty toilet paper roll to make a great hair curler. This DIY cheap hair curler does take a while to do, but over time you can build up enough of these rolls and have enough for your entire head of hair. Many women inmates do this behind bars and it allows them to have curly hair without a hair curler. So now you know some great tips to survive prison if you ever get locked up. But I would say my ultimate tip for you is to not commit crimes and go to prison. Even with all of these great hacks, it's not exactly an easy life to live. Why breaking out of prison is legal here? So first let's look at where is it legal to escape from prison in the world? Well as I said before, there are four countries which allow this. Those countries are Germany, Mexico, Austria and Belgium. But why is that the case in these four countries? Well it's because they say the desire to escape is not only a human right, it's within human nature. That means escaping and being free is in our DNA. Some of these laws are very old, for example in Germany where this law dates back to the 1800s and is over 130 years old. This very old German law brought in by the Reichstag all those years ago is still in effect today. But has anyone actually ever tried out this law in Germany? Well, prison escape in Germany is very difficult to do legally. Now, the actual act of escaping from prison is legal, but only if it doesn't break any other laws. And because it's almost impossible to escape prison without breaking another law, this makes it nearly impossible. For example, if you were a prisoner who escaped a German prison, you may have to damage the bars. And if you did that, it would be illegal as it's damaging property. Or for example, if you escape wearing your prison clothing, then that's stealing and that's illegal. Also, taking a hostage to escape or injuring anyone is also illegal. Basically, any crime you do commit while escaping will be held against you. And not only that, it's also illegal to help someone else escape from prison. So if two people escape at once, then they would have helped each other and that would be illegal. So there's pretty much no way to escape from a German prison legally. That is unless guards accidentally leave keys lying around. So if you wanted to break out of a German prison, you'd have to not only make sure you didn't break a window or any bars, you'd also have to do it without any clothes on, otherwise it would be stealing. And not only that, if they can catch you again, you're allowed to be taken back to prison. The law says you're allowed to escape from prison, but this doesn't mean the crime you were taken there for in the first place goes away. But what about in Mexico? Well in Mexico it's not punishable to escape from prison. Mexico is quite known for prison escapes. For example, Joaquim El Chapo Guzman escaped from a Mexican prison twice. However, this was not done legally, instead it was done by bribing guards. But why is escaping prison legal in Mexico? Well, it dates back to an old Mexican law named Article 154. In Mexico, freedom or liberty is defined as a human right. And it says this human right is even afforded to prisoners. However, there are some catches in Article 154. For example, it's illegal to escape if you help anyone else. AKA more than one person escaping at once is not legal. Also, if they injure anyone else like guards, prisoners or civilians, this also makes it illegal. And if you do break any of these laws while escaping from prison, this can get you an extra three years in jail. Also, if you escape in Mexico, your time outside jail is not considered part of your sentence. So that means if you're recaptured even after many years, you still have to do the time you have left on the original sentence. For example, if you get sentenced to 10 years and then escape for 9 of those, don't think that 9 goes away. Instead, you just have to spend 9 extra years in prison if you're caught. And if you go back to prison after escaping in Mexico, you do lose many privileges. You may lose certain meals and also exercise privileges. Recently, there was a large prison escape in Mexico where around 130 inmates fled using a tunnel. And in another situation, some commandos used an explosive to blow up the prison walls. Also in 2002, a Mexican burglar did actually escape from a Mexican prison. A Mexican Supreme Court judge sided with the person who escaped. They said they were actually following the law and it turned out this Mexican burglar knew about this law. In Austria, this is also the case. They say if you don't injure anyone or damage any property, you can escape from prison. That's because, much like in Mexican and German law, in Austrian law, the desire for escape and liberty is a human right. 
And in Belgium, this is also the case. A Belgium court recently ruled to keep that law in place. Some said this law encourages prisoners to try and escape in creative ways. But in Belgium, they also said that it's human nature to want to escape from prison. And also, escaping doesn't necessarily cause any harm. The only thing that would cause harm is if you broke the building or injured somebody while escaping. Belgium says it's up to prisons and police to be good enough to make sure nobody does escape. But has there ever been any really crazy escapes from a country where escaping prison is legal? Well, in 1971, Joel David Kaplan was arrested in a Mexican prison. He was arrested for fraud and taken to Mexico City's Santa Maria prison. One night, around 136 guards were watching a movie with the prisoners. That was when a helicopter landed in the prison yard. Joel Kaplan then got in the helicopter and flew away. He then arrived back in the USA and he said the process was completely legal. That's because the prison hadn't been damaged in any way and nobody was hurt. Also, the helicopter had been purchased privately, not rented. This meant nobody helped him escape from prison. And he also said because only he escaped, he wasn't helping anyone else escape. But that's not the only amazing and legal Mexican prison escape. Joaquim Loera Guzman, better known as El Chapo, also escaped many times. The most amazing escape involved him going into an underground tunnel. This tunnel went for a mile long and was equipped with electricity and a motorcycle. Now, at first, this was said to be illegal as he was clearly helped. That's because someone had to have built the tunnel and got the motorcycle for him. But because they couldn't name anyone who actually did help him as nobody knew who did it, that means it was legal. But anyone who knows about El Chapo knows he was recaptured by the USA and taken to New York. He will soon be sentenced and likely spend the rest of his life behind bars in the USA. And unlike in Mexico, in the USA, prison escape is not legal. Another country where escaping prison is not legal is South Korea. But that didn't stop one man known as the Korean Houdini. One South Korean man was a burglar, but he'd also been practicing yoga for 23 years. This allowed him to have full control over his body and convert it into any shape he wanted. This actually helped him to escape from jail. He was able to crawl through his prison food slot and escape from prison. Amazingly, the food slot was only 15 centimeters high and 45 centimeters wide. But through the use of skin ointment and yoga, this guy was able to escape. Comment down below your views of this law. Do you think it should be legal to escape from prison or not? Personally, I do understand that wanting freedom is a human right. And I suppose if it doesn't hurt anyone, then maybe it should be legal. But who's kept in America's scariest prison? Coming up first is Robert Hansen. Robert Hansen is not your run-of-the-mill criminal. In fact, he's a former FBI agent. From 1979 to 2001, he did espionage for the Soviet Union and later Russia. That's right, this guy was a double agent for 20 years. Robert Hansen has been regarded as the worst intelligence disaster in US history. During his time as a double agent, he betrayed dozens of US agents. Many of them actually lost their lives specifically due to what Robert had given to the Soviets and Russia. Right now, he's serving 15 consecutive life sentences behind bars at ADX Florence. Over the 20-year period he was a double agent, Russia paid him more than $1.5 million in cash and diamonds. He would drop off classified materials at a park near his home in Virginia, USA. Eventually, the FBI and CIA caught on and began monitoring his every move. Eventually, they caught him selling thousands of documents about US strategies and classified nuclear developments. Next up is Theodore Kaczynski. You may not know this guy by his real name, but I'm sure you know his pseudonym, the Unabomber. This man is a former mathematics professor and also a math genius. In 1969, he abandoned his academic career and began living in the woods. He then published what's known as the Unabomber Manifesto. He called for everyone to send lots of explosive devices in the mail, and that's exactly what he did. In fact, he carried out 16 bombings from 1978 to 1999. He would put these in packages and use the US mail service to deliver them. Now, these 16 devices only took three lives and injured 23 people. But because he was living in the woods all by himself, the FBI had a tough time finding him. Eventually, on the 3rd of April, 1996, FBI raided his cabin after they located it. 
But you're probably wondering, what caused this guy to go crazy? Well, he was actually part of MKUltra, which was a CIA research into mind control. The CIA psychologically destroyed this man, and that's what led him to be so crazy. He actually spent over 200 hours as part of the study. But right now, he's in ADX Florence, serving eight life sentences. Next up is Harold Nicholson. Harold Nicholson is a former CIA officer, and he's actually the highest ranking CIA officer to ever be convicted of espionage. For two years, he passed lots of classified information to Russia. It seems he actually only did it for small amounts of money, around $12,000. The FBI suspected him, and he failed three polygraph tests. He was told he passed them all, but was then secretly put under surveillance by the FBI. The FBI watched his travels when he went to Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. And during his time in Singapore, they saw him go to the Russian embassy and drop off a package. Right now, he's serving a 23-year sentence at ADX Florence. And he is set to be released on the 27th of June, 2024. It's not often you see anyone actually get out of ADX Florence. Next up is Glendon Scott Crawford. If I told you about a mad scientist making a giant x-ray machine, you'd assume it was science fiction. Well, I suppose you haven't heard of Glendon Scott Crawford. This man was a member of the Klan in the United States. But in 2009, he was sentenced to 30 years in ADX Florence. You see, he was in the process of building a gigantic x-ray machine. This would be enough to spew lethal doses of radiation and take out many people from a distance. His plan was to put this giant machine inside a truck or a van. He was then going to park it outside areas where there were minority groups and use it to take out many lives. He even wanted to drive it to the White House and take out then-President Barack Obama. But he is set to be released in 2039. But he'll be a very elderly man by then, so don't worry about him making another x-ray machine. Next up is Joaquin Guzman. If you thought Joaquin Phoenix was scary in the Joker movie, then get ready to hear about this guy. You may not know the name Joaquin Arcavaldo Guzman Loera, but I'm sure you do know his nickname El Chapo, meaning shorty in Spanish. He is the Mexican billionaire and former leader of the Sinaloa cartel. He's been arrested many times, but his biggest arrest came in 2017, after he escaped many times from Mexican prisons, including once tunneling his way out, he was taken to the USA. He was extradited to the US in January of 2017. He was charged with narco-trafficking, money laundering, and taking lives. But it wasn't until February of this year, 2019, when he was found guilty on all counts. And it was decided on the 17th of July 2019 that he would go to ADX Florence for life. He was actually sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. Now, he's known for escaping from prisons, but no one has ever escaped ADX Florence. But now his compadre El Mayo has taken over the Sinaloa cartel, so don't expect that crime to stop anytime soon. Next up is James Marcello. You've probably heard stories of Chicago mobsters. Well, no one is more quintessential than James Marcello. He was the front boss of a Chicago mob. He's better known by his nickname Little Jimmy as he's quite short in height. But just because he's short doesn't mean he's not scary. He became a made member of the Chicago mob in 1983. Being a made member is basically the highest rank in the mob. It requires you to be 100% Italian and have taken at least one life. Unbeknownst to James's mob bosses, his mother was actually Irish. But nevertheless, this was one scary guy. But right now, this Italian-American mob boss is serving life behind bars in ADX Florence. Next up is Noshir Gawadia. This man is a former employee for the US Department of Defense. In fact, he was an engineer and one of the main designers for the B2B stealth bomber. You know those scary sci-fi looking black triangles in the sky? Well, this guy was actually the main designer for those. They cost $250 million each and are said to be some of the USA's favorite toys. So why on earth would they put him in America's scariest prison? Well, in 2011, he was convicted for selling information to China. Apparently, he began giving China classified information to help them build cruise missiles. He also laundered the money that China paid him. But it's thanks to him that China now has stealth technology missiles. For this, he was sentenced to 32 years behind bars. And he's scheduled for release on the 12th of September, 2033. And finally, we have Nasser Jason Abdo. 
Nasser was a US Army private. He's from Texas and in 2010, he was training at Fort Campbell in Kentucky, USA. In June of 2010, he was set to be deployed to Afghanistan, but instead he refused to go and went AWOL. This means he basically deserted the military base and no one knew where he was. Later, he planned to use a weapon of mass destruction to take out a restaurant where many soldiers were dining. Luckily, the person he bought the materials from found it suspicious and called the police. They then tracked him down and arrested him just before he could carry out this terrible deed. He was then sentenced to two life sentences plus 60 years. What will prisons be like in 2119? It's no secret that punishment has moved on. A hundred years ago, minor things like stealing a loaf of bread could have meant your life was over. And I don't mean in a swift and painless fashion. In fact, there were many torturing devices that were used routinely a hundred years ago. Also in some places like the Soviet Union, they would use things like work camps for prisoners. This is where prisoners were effectively worked until they passed away. They had to do hard and dangerous labor like coal mining every day for no money. But today things are very different. 102 countries have abolished capital punishment. Six have done so for all offenses except under special circumstances. And right now, only 21 countries actually have the death penalty. The main ones being Saudi Arabia, USA, Iran, Vietnam, Egypt, and North Korea. And we all know that the prison system is not exactly the best. Many critics of this system say it only makes criminals commit more crime. After all, the best place for a petty criminal to learn criminal techniques is when they're surrounded by criminals. In the USA, the rate of convicts re-offending after they're out of prison is 76%. And some critics also say that many prisoners are actually mentally ill. They say they should instead get therapy and treatment in hospitals, not be put in a cage. Some countries have recently tried out what's known around the world as luxury prisons. For example, Norway has something called a humane prison. The prison cells are better than many student dorms and kind of look like an ordinary apartment. In some Norwegian prisons, prisoners can even come and go when they please. They can't mix with the general public, but they can go out in the woods and areas around the prison. They also have clinical psychologists in the prison and areas where people can get creative, for example, art and music studios. You may be thinking, Charlie, surely treating criminals so well is not a good thing. After all, won't that encourage crime? Well, that's what I thought too, until I saw the reoffender numbers. The reoffending rate in Norway is only 20%, much better than the USA's 76%. So maybe other countries should adopt Norway's prison system. But now let's go into the future and look at what prisons will be like then. If we learn from history, we can see that prisons have got more and more humane. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this trend will continue. Punishment will be more humane. In 2019, there are already companies known as e-carceration companies. One company actually makes electric monitors, which shocks inmates if they leave their houses. It tracks their every movement and it means they can only go outside when they're allowed to. Some say it's actually nicer for prisoners to stay inside their own homes. This way they won't fall into more crime or join a gang in prison. But some say for prisoners who are homebodies, this actually won't make any difference. So instead, let's look into the far future 100 years later. Many experts say that in 100 years, prisoners could be cryogenically frozen. This is where people pass away and are then frozen. Then, when the technology becomes available, they may be able to be unfrozen and reanimated. You may think that sounds like science fiction, but cryogenic freezing actually already exists. However, this only works on people who are no longer alive. You can't do it if you're already living. It's a popular myth that Walt Disney is cryogenically frozen. He actually isn't, but according to The Guardian, 300 people in the world are. Most of these people are in the USA and Russia. There are two problems with doing this right now. Firstly, there's the cost. In the USA, just to be frozen costs you $24,000. And that's with no upkeep at all. That's just the cost of you being frozen. In Russia, you can get it done slightly cheaper for $12,000, but it would still be very expensive to do it to every single inmate. And another issue right now is that you need to be dead to be cryogenically frozen. But in 100 years, I'm sure you won't need to be as this technology is adapting and changing so fast. Many say that cryogenically freezing prisoners is much more humane. If the main reason of prisons is to get dangerous people away from the general public, surely this makes sense. 
they wouldn't have to waste their entire lives behind bars, but they would be taken away from humanity for a long time. And they would still be punished, as all of their family would continue to age, but they wouldn't be. The only problem with this I can see is someone trying to live forever. Maybe some people would keep committing crimes in order to never die. Some also say this actually may be more cost effective than the prisons we have today. The prisons we have today are very, very expensive. You need to pay the wages of all of the guards, all of the food for the prisoners, and sometimes even medical care. But if people were cryogenically frozen, you wouldn't need to pay for any of that stuff, just the machines. But if we can't cryogenically freeze prisoners in 100 years, what else could be done? Well, the clue is it's big, orange, and up in the sky. I am, of course, talking about Mars. We all know that Elon Musk and SpaceX have been sending rockets to Mars. Musk says by 2028, we'll be able to have humanity on Mars. Now, he doesn't mean a regular town like you and I live in. He means astronauts could go there for some amount of time. But remember, that's in 2028. What about in 2119? Many say that we could make Mars into a prison colony. This is an idea similar to Australia. Australia used to be a penal colony. People who committed crimes in Britain would be sent to this island and would live on there. Many say that in the future we should do the same thing with Mars. But that would rely on space travel becoming much, much less expensive in the future. Right now it would cost millions to send one person there. And seeing as there's 2.2 million people currently in prison in the USA, it would cost 22 trillion to send everyone there. That's around the USA's GDP for an entire year. But if the cost of space travel significantly reduces, maybe prisoners will all be kept on Mars. Mars is already a dangerous planet, so I guess it makes sense. But many say this would actually be going backwards as it would not be more humane. The conditions in Mars are likely going to be much worse than on Earth even in a hundred years time. But even so, e-carceration, cryogenic freezing and Mars prisons may be the future of prisons.